So we are in a kind of abbreviated uh, Advent series of messages entitled um, A Christian Christmas. I told you a story last week where I was listening to the DJ in Wheeling and, and he, he, he talked about this idea of all these various types of Christmases that you could have. And he ended as one of the options being a Christian Christmas. And I really kind of balked at that and kind of bristled and I said, like, what, what, what is that? that? That doesn't even make any sense to me that somehow you're using Christian as an adjective to describe Christmas and feeling like you're not being redundant. And, uh, and so I began to think about what is Christmas and it is simply and mysteriously hope. And uh, we looked at that last week, and we looked at this idea of how there were a group of people in a several thousand years ago that truly did have hopefulness about the coming of Jesus. It was happening, and they didn't know it was happening. They had been waiting hundreds and hundreds of years, and it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve where the hope was inserted in the situation, Abraham, Moses, there was the sacrificial system that showed the people of God that, that there was a rescuer. There was going to be a way, as, as Dave said, that a, a way in the manger. And then there were the prophets that continued to give this message of hope. And, and we know that in our lives, as in the Israelites' experience, that hope goes up and down in different times and in different um, ways. And uh, we, began, we began to think about what true hope and anticipation looks like. And uh, we were hopeful that um, this idea of understanding the Old Testament hopefulness, this idea that there is such thing as an unconditional certainty, that when you follow God, when you're in relationship with God, you truly can have hope. And what hope is, is unconditional certainty. There aren't many things in this world that are certain. But when we understand God's word, we understand what he says about his son, Jesus Christ, and his coming, we believe then there is unconditional certainty, which is hope. And so this morning I want to move on from hope and look at another truth about Christmas. That Christmas is simply and equally mysteriously love. More specifically, the love of God for his children, for, for you and for me. And it is certainly simple but mysterious. And, and there's a great risk when you talk about love. And, and that risk is that we indeed ignore the obvious and there's so many things in our lives that we just are so obvious to us that we choose to ignore them. And I believe that love and the love of God is one of those most obvious things to us, but we choose to ignore the obvious. And we go right to the most famous verse in all of the Bible is John 3.16. How did we all know that? How did we all know? Because it's so obvious. And I believe that the commonplace, we have to do deny the commonness of John 3.16 because the truth that lies within this verse is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We must deny the commonplace. We actually have to hope that our knowing, the, the thing that is above from the neck up, the knowing is how you know something. And we have to also believe that our understanding, which is from the neck down, so you know things from the neck up, you understand things from the neck down. So you feel something. When you understand it, you feel it, you experience it, you live it. You can know something, but you also have to understand it, and that's the neck down. And I pray... That when we think about the love of God, not only would our knowledge, but our understanding would continue to grow stronger each and every year. Asking God this year to further illumine that we are unworthy benefactors of something that is indescribable, infinite, invaluable, and never 
unfailing. And that's the love of God. Indescribable. Undeniable. Infinite. Invaluable. Never failing. That God loves you. And he gave himself to you to demonstrate that love. John, 1 John 4.10 says, this is love. So John's just going to define it for us. If we didn't get it in John 3.16, in 1 John 4.10 he says, this is love, colon, not that we love God, not that what we bring to the table is the definition of love. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So when Matthew 1.18 says, this is how the birth of Jesus has come about, and it begins to lay out the logistics of Mary and Joseph and the travels and, and all these different things, we must be- believe that it doesn't begin right there. The birth of Jesus is not starts with the angel talking to Mary. It actually starts with the love of God. And here's why I think we need to set this up. I was reading a book recently, or I am reading a book. I'm not completed with it. And the author's name is Brennan Manning. And he writes this, and it's on the back cover. And this really just gripped me as I began to think about This idea that we are so capable of ignoring the obvious. It says on the back cover of Brennan Manning's book. Is an imposter robbing you of God's love? We've bought into the lie that we are worthy of God's love only when our lives are going well. If our families are happy or our jobs are meaningful, life is a success. But when life begins to fall through the cracks and embarrassing sins threaten to reveal our less than perfect identity, we scramble to keep up a good front to present to the world and to God. We hide until we can rearrange our mask of perfection. Sadly, it is then that we wonder why we lack intimate relationships and passionate faith. All this time, God is calling us to take the mask off and come openly to him. He longs for us to know in the depth of our being that he loves us and accepts us as we are. When we are our true selves, we can finally claim our identity as God's child, Abba's child, and experience his pure pleasure In who we are. Let go of the imposter lifestyle and freely accept our belovedness as a child of the Heavenly Father. In Him, there is life. Okay, so what Manning is saying in this is that the love of God is simple and mysterious. And so if we're ever going to talk about love, we must talk about the Father's love. Not the love of God, but the Father's love. Abba, Father. Romans 8.15 says this. The spirit you receive does not make you a slave so that you have, you have to live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. And so church, I want us and I desire for us to take a heart-moving look at God's amazing love for you and for me. And for me this week, it has been summed up in this word, Abba. What does that even mean? The the Jewish tradition tells us that that's one of the first words that that a Hebrew baby ever learns is Abba. And we would would translate it Daddy. But but if you look at it a little bit more closely, it's it's slightly more reverent than just Daddy. 
It's kind of dearest father would be the truest definition of, of what they're saying. They're saying dearest father. But, but the application of it, church, is still the same as what we mean when we say daddy. Intimacy, tenderness, dependence, security, and confidence of care. It's never a lazy comfort. And so when we say Abba, we're not just saying, oh yeah, right, we know we have him. We know we have everything he offers. He's kind of our dad. He's going to take care of it. Don't worry about anything. It's more of a get in his lap and crawl up and, and get across and next to his chest and know that there's something there that cannot be given anywhere else. That you know the source and the truest sense of love is found by your heavenly father. I mean, a slave is kept at a distance, but a child draws near. It's not a formal type of love, but it's a natural affection. It's speaking with freedom and, and boldness. I mean, the word Abba is, is really the, one of the only few words that is accepted by every nation, language, and people. So it never has to be translated anywhere. No matter where you go and no matter what country you're in and no matter what language they speak, they choose not to translate the word Abba because they know what it means. It transcends people groups and, and nations and languages. It's true vocabulary of faith. That when you say Abba, you're talking about the love of God. And the object of that love is you. The demonstration of that love is Jesus. The definition of that love is this idea of adoption. So when we say the demonstrations of God's love, it's, it's Jesus. When we try to communicate this love, we say it's Abba. When we try to define it, it's this idea of adoption. That we weren't in relationship with God at some point, but because of his great love for us, he has adopted us into the family. And, and in a minute, I want to share a little bit more briefly, or a little bit more about that. But, but think about the words of the most famous prayers. We talked about the most famous scripture. What's the most famous prayer, right? The Lord's Prayer, right? How's that start out? Oh, my. Not God, oh, reverent, holy, gracious. No, it's our Father. Because he understands and we understand and Jesus understands that there is something about being in relationship with Abba. And so you can say, our Father who art in heaven, and you can say it with joy and confidence because he is your Abba. And so even on the darkest days, we cry out, Abba. And we're saying that we are willing to trust our Father's heart even when we cannot trace his hand. When you whisper, Abba, you're saying, God, I'm not even sure where you're taking me. I'm not even sure how this turns out. But I'm trusting your heart for me instead of looking for your hand in my life. When you whisper, Abba, you're saying, I may not see what you're doing, but I trust what you're doing. Can I get an amen? That's the truth of whispering, Abba. I mean, that's what Jesus said. On his toughest, roughest night in Gethsemane, he's on the eve of being uh, uh, crucified. And he sits down to pray. Mark 14, 36. Look it up. It says, Abba. In his darkest hour, he's crying out, not to his, oh, gracious God. He's crying out to his daddy God. 
And he says, listen. This is the Greco paraphrase. So this is not a quotation. Hey, if there's any other way to get this done, can you do that? But if not, we'll do it your way. But he begins that conversation with Abba, Father. And the only time he doesn't refer to God in this way is while he's on the cross, he's carrying the weight of our sin, and he says what? My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? He had the separation. In that moment on the cross, there was that separation between he and his Abba. He could not refer to him as Abba because he was carrying the weight of the sin. And so this relationship got much, much more formal. And he's asking God why he has been forsaken, why there has been a separation. But you want to know something really, really, really interesting? It was really only in that moment. Because when he takes his last breath, he actually goes back to Abba language. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my soul. There was only a moment where he was separated. But when it would time and the chips were down, he went back to the Abba language. And so I want us to know today that in the darkest days, When we cannot trace his hands, we must trust Abba's heart and love for you and for me. During the most severe trials and afflictions, we must approach Abba with complete confidence and childlike dependence and absolute assurance that he will never desert or forsake us in our moment of need. The author author of Hebrews says it in chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of what? In our time of need. Why is that scripture true? It's not because God reigns on some throne in heaven where we've never been before. It's true because he's our Abba. He loves us. And when we are made his children, we have rights and privileges as children. And so we can approach him as our Abba, as our Father. And that's what gives us confidence. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Listen to that language. The language is true today because he is our Abba and our Father. Love demonstrated is Jesus. Love communicated is Abba. Love defined is adoption. And wow, we have so many great examples of adoption in our church. And so there's really no need to to, to, to explain the, the common idea of adoption and how you take someone who is not in your family and you make that person legally part of your family, spiritually part of your family, physically part of your family. But I want us to know that the, the adoption that's talked about in this, he, uh, this Romans passage takes it just one nth further. It's the emphasis not just upon you becoming rightfully part of a family. But the emphasis is even further on this idea that you are made the rightful heir to the throne. To the inheritance. It's not just, hey, you know what, you, were, you weren't in our family, now you're in our family. But they take it one step further. They said, you're in our family and not only are you in our family, you are the heir to the dynasty. You're the heir to the inheritance. You are co-heirs with Christ. Have you heard that phrase before? That's what he's talking about. When you've been adopted, when you've been accepted into the family, when you have been welcomed in by Abba Father, you're not just part of the family, you're co-heir with Christ. And co-heir means the same favor shown to Christ is shown to you and to I. We are the center, the most precious, the apple of God's eye. 
the recipient of his love, the delight of his focus. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit becoming part and and being given to us when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, what, what that Holy Spirit is, that Spirit being poured into us is to confirm our adoption. So that if you ever wonder whose you are, you need to simply just look within yourself and realize that you have God within you. And that is your confirmation that you are a child of God. That you have been chosen by God. And he loves you. And he has given his spirit to you in order to confirm your adoption. If you look back at that Romans passage, the spirit you receive does not make you slave. Romans 8.15. It doesn't make you a slave so that you live in fear again. See, here's what's happening, is that so often when we live without, outside of the relationship with God, our lives are consumed by fear and bondage. But when we enter into this relationship, when we understand that whose we are and that we have been adopted, that slavish fear towards God is changed into a confident and peaceful affection for God as our Father. Are you with me? So here's where the script gets flipped. Pascal, who was a mathematician, I'm not sure why he said spiritual things, but Pascal said this, God made man in his own image, and man returned the compliment. So you know what that means? God made man in God's image, And what man has now done is made God in our image. And so what that means is, is that we think God thinks like us. We think that God rationalizes things like us. And how we react to things, God reacts to things. And the way we think about things, God thinks about things. The way we behave is how God behaves. And church, that is wrong. It's just flat wrong. You know what they call that? They call that projecting. We need to stop projecting what we think as what God thinks. So just because you have self-hatred doesn't mean God hates you. Just because you're shameful doesn't mean that God is ashamed of you. Just because you're contemplating failure doesn't mean that God is contemplating failure. Just because you're upset with yourself doesn't mean that God is upset with you. God is indeed in love. He relentlessly loves you. He compassionately loves you. And not in spite of your sin and my sin, but with them. God loves you. No matter where you're at and no matter what you're going through. God loves you. Now, here's the thing. It gets you, take it to the edge, and you have to walk it back a second. Because what I'm not saying is that God condones sin. I'm not saying that God is sanctioning evil. So, by no means does God sanction or condone sin and evil. But equally as true is he does not withdraw or limit his love because of sin. Just because it's present doesn't mean he loves you less. You may not be able to experience his love, but that doesn't change in any way what he thinks about you. Instead, church, we must desire and God desires that we come to him as our Abba Father. God loves you for who you really are, whether we like it or not. And so today, in this season, on this Advent, as we approach this Christmas, my prayer, my hope, my ask, is that you would make a serious attempt to see yourself as God sees you. 
and allow yourself to receive and understand God's radical love for you. Jesus' coming is that sign that God chose you. God chose you. God loves you. You know, I know these words were meant for the Israelites and God's first family, but I wonder if they aren't appropriate to you and to I today. Isaiah 43, verses 1, 2, and 4 say this. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Church, he knows you by name. He loves you. He's chosen you. He is willing to make an exchange for you. Now we know on this side of the cross what that exchange is. I'm not sure, and I didn't study deep enough to understand if Isaiah was really talking about the exchange on the cross, but it seems appropriate to me when he says in verse 4, since you are precious and honored by, in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Doesn't that sound a whole lot like Jesus will die so that I could live? You are worth that exchange. Not that we understand it. Not, not that we understand God's love. It's, it's both simple and mysterious. Isaiah 54.10 says, Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. I don't know what your mountains shaken and your hills being removed means to you. But the truth of this scripture is that there is unfailing love. And that's the thing that will not be shaken. Why? Because he's our father. Because he's Abba. And because he loves us. Let me just close with one more scripture. 1 John 3, 1, same, same theme, different verse. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. You know, one of the things that I picked out of this scripture is that John, it is John, right? Hold on. Okay, John. He actually starts with a question word, and, and I, don't, I don't understand English. As, as I should have paid attention more in high school. Um, but when he starts out with what great love, he, he's actually not saying, asking a question, but he's using a question word. And he, he's saying, he, he's just like kind of speaking it into the air. It, it's like, what, what a great love, or how great this love. Or, and he's basically saying that there's, this, there's a, this is a different type of love. There's, this is an otherness. This isn't common. This is not indigenous to the, this place and in, in this space. He's saying, what, what, so what great love the Father has lavished on us. And basically the inference here is that this type of love is foreign. It's not common to this location. That this type of love is, is indigenous. It's not indigenous to this earth. And I just, I don't know why I was struck by that this, this week, is that, that, that what we're trying to observe about God, 
about Abba, about the coming of Jesus being that demonstration, that's not common to us. We are not used to this unconditional love. But here's the thing. Our unfamiliarity with it doesn't change it. Just because we don't understand it doesn't change it. And when he talks about lavishing this love on us, the, the word lavish means to, to see it manifested or made visible and, and demonstrated. And so I want to ask you today, when I talk about you being Abba's child, is that part of, of your worship? When you're worshiping and you're thanking and you're praising God, does that ever factor in, well, I'm, I'm loved by you. I'm your child. I am an heir to you. I've been adopted by you. Is it, is it part of your prayer time? When you talk to Abba, or you talk to God, when you pray to God, do, do, you, do you come to him as a child? Do, do you think of him as your father? Church, is, is, it, is this Abba child, is, is this part of your worldview? I mean, do you view yourself as you walk and talk and move in the circles you walk and talk and move in as a child of God, as a co-heir with Christ. It, it, it makes me think this week. I ask you those questions because I ask myself those questions. Would that change the way that I worship God if I was thinking more as an Abba's child? Would it, would it change my prayer time if I saw it as talking to my Father in heaven? Would it change the way I live if it was part of my worldview? Church, Jesus coming demonstrated God's love. Abba communicates God's love and adoption. You being adopted defines. God's love. And so I pray in the week ahead that you and I would simply allow God to love us. That's who he is. He's Abba. Amen. Amen.